Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Last week we began to um, study Paul's writing of Romans. Uh, he is in the uh, city of Corinth at this time. We got uh, about three verses in and got hung up. So, praise the Lord. Uh, Let's go ahead and pick up there and we'll, we'll move on. Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by the prophets and the holy scriptures. And that's kind of where we got off. Got talking about the, the Old Testament with scriptures and how it's the word of God. Concerning his son Jesus, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Remember last week we talked about that the spirit of holiness was a manifestation. And uh, we, you know, why, did, why of all the things he could have chosen to say that he was declared to be the son of God with power, it was with the spirit of holiness that he declared it. By the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have, we have received our great, uh, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom ye also, or, uh, ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Um, actually, it's really called saints. It's not called to be saints. To be is not in the Greek. It's added because the translators thought it would add uh, continuity to the, to the sentence. But really, this is called saints. Grace be to you and uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Make him request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now this was Paul's desire, um, <clears throat> was to go to the church at Rome and minister to them. And Paul did not start that church. But uh, he, he even talks about not building on the man's foundation. But it was just his heart to go and to share there. Uh, the doctrinal uh, um, structure of this letter is so strong that it's even referred to by some uh, historians as the gospel according to Paul. Because it talks about our, our position in Christ and who we are in Christ and justification by, by, by grace and through faith. And it talks about those things so much so that they actually they'll even refer to it as the gospel according to Paul. Um, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. Now notice Paul didn't want to give them a gift, impart gifts into them so that they could go around and tell everybody how great they are. He wanted them to be established. The end result of, 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 of imparting things was to establish them. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not you have you, brethren, uh, ignorant brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. In other words, he was hindered. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among the Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now, he's, he's not saying here, he owes, he's saying he is uh, he's committed and has an obligation to minister to the um, barbarian and to the Greek, to the wise and to the unwise. He's called to minister, okay? So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I wish the church was doing this today. I wish the church was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. We've gotten really cute. We want to be cute with everything. We want to be slick. We want to you know, be almost spiritual charlatans where we trick people into stuff. But Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, we got people who don't want to talk about Jesus. They want to be, you know, accepting of everybody's religion. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. It was brought to the Jews first. That's, that's what he's saying. It doesn't mean that, you know, they get to line up all the time at this point. No, it was brought to the Jews first. They rejected it. Then it went to the church, to the Gentiles. Okay? Uh, for therein, what is it? In the gospel of Christ. 
is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God, just, get you stop, just stop there for a second. Why are we even talking about the wrath of God? Because you hear some people talk and hear some people teach and preach. There's no such thing anymore. But it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed it unto them. Let's stop it for a second. Now, Paul just got through talking about that, you know, he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, it's the power of God and the salvation for the Jew first and into the Greek. And then he turns right around and starts talking about the wrath of God being revealed. In the church, and particularly in, in, in our word of faith, charismatic circles, over, you know, it has a propensity to just deny that there's any wrath of God. God doesn't judge, you know, especially down the new hyper grace thing. Now, grace is not hyper grace, but the hyper grace is taking, you know, hyper, like, we, we, you can take hyper faith, you know. Uh, people didn't like that term back when, back when we were teaching faith real strong. But I'll be honest with you, when you start believing somebody else's wife, that's hyper faith. It's out of line. It's not biblical. So you could just say unbiblical faith or a teaching on faith. Unbiblical teachings on grace, Okay. Uh, would, would have you think that there is no consequence for walking in ungodliness and unrighteousness and holding in disdain the truth. And there is. The Bible says here, what Paul says right here, the preacher of grace, as many call him, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Let me say something. People know when they're doing wrong. They have an inner witness that they're not doing something right when they're doing something wrong. Why? Be you know, <clears throat> because in man, there's an innate law, a moral code of God that's just in man. It's there. God put it there. And that's why you'll see um, societies say over and have the same law. Murder is, is wrong in any society. Why? Because that is in man. It's the moral code of God that he placed in man when he created him. If we evolve, we just wouldn't have that in every human being. You know, people say, well, we evolved from an amoeba, you know, and all this kind of stuff. There was a spark in life. And we all invite, evolved to these intelligent creatures with a moral code and a consistent moral code throughout humanity. You know, that, that, uh, that stealing is wrong. That, that murder is wrong. That rape is wrong. Okay? And so we, we go through these things. There's a, there's a moral code. And so the Bible tells us here that God showed it unto them. It's in, it's in man. There's a moral code. Even if you're not a Christian, God put a moral code in you of right and wrong. It's, it's the intelligentsia with all their degrees that come along and say, you know, it's, you know, it's wrong to tell somebody that something is wrong. Well, then you establish a moral code of, of, of what's wrong. If you tell me it's wrong to tell somebody that something is wrong, then you've established a, a system of morality. Am I not right, Brother Bill? You know, really, you're, you're, you're in a dichotomy. You're, in a, you're, in a, uh, you're really lying. You know, the old catch-22. You're telling me it's wrong to tell people something's wrong. Then you've set yourself up with a moral standard. You've established a moral standard when you do that. We don't have time for that. Anyway. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him, that is God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I can tell you, anybody on the planet who's never heard Jesus Christ, they will cry out to the God of him because they, there's, there's a sense in them that there's God. And say, reveal yourself to me. He will. You go study, people have had things, you know, in seven days a white man is going to show up and tell you, tell you how to find God. And, and uh, Stanley Livingston came right in seven days later to the village. And they said, yes, we know, we, you got, you got, we, need, what you, we need to hear what you have because we, we have vision. We know this. We've been waiting for you. 
Praise God. Amen? All right. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart and was darkened. Now, you can make a decision, and humanity over and over again has made a decision to reject the reality of God with their own imaginations. They've allowed their minds. And when you follow some of the logic of atheists and, and um, uh, uh, evolutionists, you, I mean, they got more faith than any Christian I've ever met to actually believe that we became not, not just creatures who are living. We evolved into creatures with, with the ability to think, to reason, to create, to speak, to communicate with a verbal language and numerous languages all over the world. And um, to think that all just happened. I, of course, there was nothing here before. There was a cosmic boom and all this stuff started circulating. And then all of a sudden, after a gazillions of years of the circulation, a planet was formed. And then out of that planet, it was a right, a perfectly exact distance from the sun. And, you know, to have water and to have oxygen and a spark took place and life was created and it evolved into all we see. Man, you got faith. No, actually, you're stupid. It takes, it's just, it's, it's SOS, stupid on steroids, to actually believe that. What happens? The mind, you just sit there and dream this stuff up. We created life in a laboratory. Yes, you, intelligent being, put all the elements together to get a spark. It took intelligent design for that to take place. So anyway, we're moving right along. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, I'm, ta I'm just talking aloud with the Bible. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like that of corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them, also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Stop here. God's, what's about to follow, God says, is the dishonoring of the body. Now, there are people in the, in the uh, uh, metropolitan community churches, and they are, they are not a church. They're, they're, they're antichrist. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. They believe, they, 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 they say stuff. They say they're Christians, but you can't be. You cannot take the Bible and deny the truth of the Word of God and then say you're a Christian. It just don't work that way. Okay? You can't, have, you can't say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. You can't do it. But look what he says here. God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. Now, Sir Elton John just said that he believes that Jesus would have approved homosexual marriage. Aren't we glad we got the authority of Elton John to tell us this? Yeah, Benny and the Jets. Uh, Rocket Man. Saturday nights and all right for dancing and doing the crocodile rock. And because he was such a popular figure in England, they, they knighted him. Only because he was a, he was a, he was a famous artist. Just, just because Elton John says Jesus would approve homosexual marriage doesn't mean Jesus would approve homosexual marriage. Look at what the Bible says. Jesus didn't ever approve homosexual marriage. The Word of God never does. So, Sir Elton John, you're wrong. And I don't want to say sir because that's the title they gave you. He's more like the elephant in the Disney cartoons. Who changed? Y'all finally getting that? <laughs> it just kind of settled in. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. What kind? Vile. I've heard people say, well, if you know homosexuals can't, can't have, you know, be buried, they need somebody to love. They don't, need, they don't need to love outside the commands of God. 
You know, it's, it's judgmental. And I, get, I, I just get furious with preachers who come along and are for, for pro, you know, they were against Proposition 1 or 8, whatever it was in North Carolina, that, was, that would not accept homosexual marriage. How can you call yourself a minister of the gospel and God calls it vile affection? Okay? For even their women did change the natural use into that which was against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Now folks, that means that if you've left the natural use of the woman, then anything else you're doing is unnatural. Another word for unnatural is perverted. Hence, pervert. Now, I don't go around calling people perverts all the time, but I'm telling you that it is unnatural for a man to be, in, to, to be attracted to and engaged in unnatural relationships with another man. It is not natural. I was born this way. Hogwash. You were not born that way. Well, they've done studies. Give me, they've done studies about global warming. We all found out. You know, the hot, they just came out with, the, the climatologist just almost secretly admitted that July 1936 was the hottest month on record and not something 2012, August 2012. They, they just kind of did it under the table. Why? Because it destroys their, their, all their study and all their data. Yeah, and Antarctica has, has got the largest ice Growth ever. And you know what they say? It doesn't really, that's not, that doesn't mean anything. Now, when it was melting and you had polar bears floating around on the ice, it meant everything. Now, these are the same ones who do the studies and say that people are born homosexual. What happens? They get money from some grant somewhere to do a study and they got to come up with a, you know, an answer and they all make their living off the grant. So, you know what you know, most of these studies being? <laughs> Because they're, not, because they're just done because they're getting a grant to do it and they keep getting the money by keep coming up with data that makes people happy and they keep giving them money and they all keep living off of it. Just like, remember, the, what was it, Farm Aid or whatever they did and, and two years later none of the money had actually made it to the people who needed it but like $80,000 had gone to this administrative secretary and, you know, 50000 went to this person and all these people were making their living off of that money sitting there and drawing interest. Because like $20 million or something came in. Let me just say this. In the world of academia, you have to take their studies with a lump of salt. Not a grain, a lump. Particularly when their studies are grant-driven. If they are grant-driven... And the universities want the grants because they, their professors get to get the money. And that money comes into the school. And they get to go into the classroom. And they get to teach. And they get to write books. And they get to go on the tour. And all this, it's all about M-O-N-E-Y. Follow the money. Now, they're the same ones telling you that people are born that way. The Bible says you're not. The Bible says it's unnatural. So it's not normal to be that way. Hello. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one to another, men working with men, that which is unseemly. Now, let me look this up because I, I need to, I forgot what that word meant, but it, it's not a good, it doesn't mean anything good. Okay? It's not like unseemly just kind of means, you know, you know, not really cool or whatever. It's, it's a little, little more than that. Romans chapter 1, verse 27. Let's see here. That which is unseemly. Indecent. Um, shameful. It's shameful what they do. It's indecent. And we wanted to, we're running around telling everybody talking about sexual orientation and how normal it is. Canada, if you preach against homosexuality in the pulpit, you could be arrested. And if our current administration has a way, it would be the same thing here. Look at this or this. Working that which is indecent, which is shameful, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, they... Let 
do we, need, do we even need to go into it? Until it became a political disease, AIDS was a homosexual disease. It entered the heterosexual population because politically correct people limited the ability of the Centers for Disease Control to do anything about it. You couldn't tell who they were. You couldn't inform anybody that they had it. They were, it was, it, any, any other disease like that, it would have been mandatory to tell who had it. But because it was homosexual and it fit a certain agenda, they had to get into the heterosexual population so they couldn't say it was a homosexual disease. And they, they are not, it's the only disease I know of that you can, that you can have it, go to the doctor, and, that, and, and know that it's deadly. And that person's a walking murderer if they're going out having relationships with other people and can't tell anybody that they've got it. If they had bubonic plague, they would quarantine them. But because it was a political, it was politicized, it was stopped. But yet, it is the just recompense of their reward. They received, because of what they were doing, a, a, the just reward for it. I'm not trying to be mean, but this is, this is Paul. Paul jumps right in on the Romans, man. And why do you think he was saying this to the Romans? Go study your history. They were a homosexual society. Now, no, now think, see, we think in the, in the secret sensitive church, we shouldn't address issues that would be offensive to the populace just so we can get them in the door. Paul writes in the first chapter to the church at Rome, a, a, a society given over to homosexuality, even worse than that, pedophilia, and bless in the first 27 verses, homosexuality. <clears throat> I find that amazing. You, and you see, people come along and say, well, we should never talk about things. We should never make people feel bad. Always make them feel good. Paul didn't. Paul said, I want to come to you. I had to get there. But here it is. Your society's messed up. Remember when you study the Bible, you need to know who it was written to, when it was written, why it was written, the circumstances, the conditions of the time in which it was written. To get a to get a understanding and the parameters for understanding of why what what was being said, Paul just wasn't writing to the church at Rome about homosexuality and just talking about it just because it just happened to be the top of his head for that day. He was writing that because the Roman society was was wholly given over to that that lifestyle. And Brother Summerall said that no great a nation has lasted more than 200 years, really over 200 years, and the Roman Empire, and then you can start talking about the Roman Empire, Rome fell for two reasons, litigation and homosexuality. And we sue over everything now. I mean, you look at me, Ron, I'm suing you, you make me feel bad. Litigation. Homosexuality. Man, I've been telling you since, the, the, since Obama opened last year in the election and, sa and said he was for homosexual marriage and everything, it's, it's been unleashed on our nation, coming out of everywhere. And the churches, church, straighten up. Pastors, straighten up. How dare you stand in your pulpit and condemn to hell people because you won't have the guts to say what the Bible says. Who do you think you are? That went over good. Just wish I could hear back. No, I don't, because I don't want any Mickey Mouse letters. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them to a reprobate mind. <coughs> that means mind void of judgment. Now, you get, you get around people who are Lesbians and homosexuals and transgender and uh, bisexual and all this. Their, 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 their morals and their judgment stink. They get more and more perverse. The longer they live that lifestyle, the more perverse they become. Hello? I know this is, this is really whatever, but they had a man out in Seattle a couple years ago. They, they, his partner took him and dropped him off at the emergency room and left him there. His bowels had been ruptured because they had gone to a horse stable and allowed the horse 
to uh, take care of them. That's just become, what is that? A mind void of judgment. They become more and more and more perverse. And it killed him. And God says that they're given over to a mind void, a reprobate mind. To do what? To do those things which are not convenient. Now, convenient don't mean, you know, you just didn't have the time. Convenient, that's not what it means here. Okay? Trying to get the, the right word here, what it, what it means, which are not convenient. Fit. Fit. Which are not fit. It's not right. Being, listen, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. I, I remember years ago they were having a homosexual parade somewhere and, and uh, they, were, you know, they were mocking the Catholic Church. And so they were out there doing stuff dressed up like Mary and just being, and the, the, the mocking you know, the mocking of Jesus, the mocking of God, the mocking of, of, of church icons um, is just rampant. Uh, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of what? Death. My God. You got pastors going around saying that there's nothing wrong with it and the Bible says that it's the worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure or consent with them that do them. They want others to be involved in their stuff. Now, how you can read this and come away and go, there's nothing in the Bible about homosexuality. You got that Bible that doesn't have Romans chapter 1 in it. Pour it out. Sold it in your bookstore. Ripped it out. You know, and I heard somebody saying in the Metropolitan Community Church, they've done, they've done a study on the word reprobate or, you know, uh, an abomination in the Old Testament. It talks about that he lies with another man as with a woman. It's an abomination. And that word abomination means something totally different. Well, I can't forget that. Forget the Old Testament. There's Romans chapter 1. God called it vile affection, called it indecent, shameful, not fit, and it's worthy of death. And if you're a Christian, and you're, you're giving your okay to, which don't mean doodly squat in heaven. It might mean the people you're talking to, they might just take you as the, as the, count, as the counselor of all counselors because you gave them what they wanted to hear. But you'll have to stand before God and answer for giving counsel outside the authority of the word of God. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or hateful, but it's time. I'm, preaching, I'm talking to the church. I'm not talking to sinners. You need Jesus, and Jesus will straighten you up if you'll let him. But it's time the church stopped playing games and trying to convince people it's okay to live in sin. We're going to preach the gospel and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And that is more, I know that the, 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 the word comes from, you know, changing one's mind. But there's more to repentance than just changing your, how, changing your mind. Why? Because we know that Jesus said, except a man be born again. The renewing of the mind is a process that takes place later. But repentance is more than simply changing your mind. That, maybe that was the Greek word, but it was elevated into a stronger meaning. Repent, everyone, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's more than just, than just saying, I changed my mind. I now, believe, you know, I now don't believe I should do that anymore. That's more than that. Repentance Actually, godly sorrow worketh repentance. To be sorry, to have a sorrowfulness for, for displeasing God. Can I get two grunts, one amen, and a holy, uh? Amen. It's still true. And, we, and the church is playing too many games with people's lives. Hello? 
I mean, and our society is messed up. They had some woman or, or was getting beat the other day by, by people, and people were standing around, and instead of helping her and stopping them, they got out their cell phones and videoed it. What is wrong? What? They've gotten that mind void of judgment. Oh, this is going to go viral. They're more concerned about it going viral on the Internet than they are stopping somebody from you know, like killing somebody. The value of human life and human dignity and its image representing God has been lost to an atheistic, godless society and humanistic mindset that has been preached from our schools and preached from our politicians now and preached from our presidency to the whole nation and to the world and it's been, it's been shoved down people's throats to the point that they no longer have a mind that recognizes the value of God. Abortion started a lot of this. The devaluing of human life and sanctity. Innocent. It amazes me the same bozos that are protesting for abortion protest against the death penalty to a mass murderer. It's messed up. Well, what did the Bible say? That the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. You know what the Bible says? And so the, the, the mind's void of judgment operate in an earthly, sensual, and devilish wisdom. It is a, the Bible calls it the wisdom of this world. It is a demonic wisdom that people walk in. And it makes perfectly good sense to their messed up head. They think they're right. And yet Paul, and Paul did not encourage it. Paul did not pat him on the back and say it's all right. Paul called it what it was. You have a mind void of judgment. That you not only know the penalty for what you're doing, you take pleasure in it and you rejoice when other people don't join in on it with you. That's devilish. It's just like the guy goes in and shoots his wife, his kids, and then kills himself. That's devilish. Okay, you got problems. You're messed up. Why are you going to kill your kids? Why are you going to kill your wife? Because nobody, if I can't have them, nobody's going to have them. You're sick. You're full of the devil. D-E-V-I-L. He does exist. He's the God of this world. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said so. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. We have to get back to where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has a, has a stand and authority and speaks truth and stops speaking all this other mess. And I know for a lot of people, they get more people in the door because they, they'll, they'll not tell the truth. But getting them in your door doesn't get them in the door of heaven. And that's what we're about. We're about getting them into the door of heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> There's no way I'm going into chapter 2. Because if you know, all your anti-judgment people go, Thou for thou man who judges, and who art thou that judgest another, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself also, for thou judgest doest the same things. Now that's, you've got to take everything Paul says in context. You got people who just believe the church and nobody should ever say somebody's doing something wrong that's judgmental. No, God's already judged. Paul just wrote a whole chapter of what the judgment of God was. So to say that we're not supposed to judge it because he comes back and says what he says, if you'll read, we study this, and so we'll give you the parameters for it. You look down through it and you'll find out Paul's talking about unjust judgment. Thou that sayest that thou shouldn't you know, worship idols, or do you commit sacrilege? If you're, if, you're, if you're giving, you know, uh, thou shalt not kill, do you kill? You sh do they don't steal, do you steal? Are you robbing and judging people because they rob? See, we, you know, you can't have unjust judgment. That's, that's the whole thing. When we get to the New Testament talking about not judging or not judging properly, it's unjust judgment. But if you say what the Bible says, that's not judgment. That's just saying what the Bible says. Hello? If I say homosexuality is a sin, it's not Ed Taylor judging. The Bible's already said it. I'm just repeating God. And he's a better authority than anybody that you know. Because he's the one you got to talk to when you leave here. 
I won't be sitting on the throne when you get there. The one who wrote the book will be. Like I said, if I'm right and you're wrong, if you're right and I'm wrong, when we die, we won't ever know it. Because you'll draw your last breath and that'll be it. But if I'm right and you're wrong, yeah, that's a long haul, dude. Isn't that right, Janice? All right. So, next Wednesday night, everybody say next Wednesday night. We're going to get into chapter 2. Hallelujah. It's going to be fun, Romans. We're going to be here for a while. See, Paul really takes the first three chapters and lays out a lot of stuff. Then he comes back and begins to talk about righteousness. and being, you know. But those first three chapters, he, he's not easy on sin. Brother Bill grew up Southern Baptist. He knows the Romans road map. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? You got to lead him down the Romans road map. Hallelujah. And the first three chapters is, is here's where you're at. <laughs> then you get out of there, here's where you need to go. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.